I am fully aware of the crises of our time. I'm fully aware that people are troubled and worried and afraid because of a plague that's going around the world. And we have rights to take precaution. But as I said to this house earlier this week, Fear is an accelerant yeah. like gasoline and you throw it out there in your path and sickness and disease will find you. The fear of the coronavirus is more dangerous than the disease. I said fear of coronavirus is more dangerous. You can be healed of a disease, but fear will take you to the grave. Yes. You can be healed of a disease, but fear will take you to the grave. Yes. I fully expect in the coming days they to close the hospitals except for patients and employees. That may or may not be necessary. Sometimes we act aggressively. Not to act aggressively, but to appear that we're acting aggressively. And that's fine. And I don't know what dwells in your house. But by the authority vested in me by the word of God, I'm telling you in his house. Yeah. The liar of fear is not permitted in this place. Fear is what a life feels like. It shall not slither in this space amongst the redeemed of the Lord. I stop my foot on the head of the enemy. I declare that great faith rises up from the belly and the shout of the redeemed of the Lord. You are healthy by the word of the Lord. You are blessed by the will of God. The power of the throne keeps you well and strengthened. You are sustained by the revelation. I'm not telling you that folk who go to church don't get sick. I don't pastor those people. But I say to this house, I speak to this house by the authority of the word upon which we stand, upon which we agree, upon which we speak. We are the redeemed of the Lord. We shall not be afraid of hell. Hell shall be traumatized by your testimony. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And our testimony is, he is more than enough. We are saved, we are kept. We are well, we are delivered from fear. We are more than conquerors. And we lift up our hands and say, count me in the redeemed. Count me in the righteous. Count me as those who are well and kept by God. Fill us, fill us with your spirit and with great faith. Come on, feel us. We have not come here to comfort anybody's fear or to acclimate or accommodate your uncertainty, but to confront every lying thing and to say, He alone is Lord. worship him. Yeah. 
for those for those who might not understand what some of this is we noted earlier this week that when you give God a praise today you might step away from the song you sang but the sound you made attached itself to the word to a promise so that Tuesday afternoon when you go up against a battle and somehow or another you step into that thing and you don't have time to pray, you don't have time to call upon the name of the Lord because you got blindsided by hell, yet you come through it, it's because you established, a, you established a Tuesday victory through a Sunday praise. I said, I established a Thursday afternoon triumph by a Sunday morning, hallelujah. So what you hear and feel, what we are experiencing in this place this morning by this rapturous sound of the redeemed of the Lord is we are not simply celebrating what God has done, but anticipating the victories we shall experience in the coming days because of the hands that were lifted and the hands that were clapped and the shouts that were rendered when we were gathered in the house. So when there are times that you see me standing by and just letting a glory moment saturate. I'm not lost. I'm navigating. And I know that victories are being sealed for battles you haven't seen. Devils are being defeated before threats can be made. Healing is being rendered before a diagnosis is even known. There are all kinds of days in ministry. Yesterday was one of the really good ones. One of the sweetest days of ministry where one of our newborns, Miss Olivia Penn, who had been in the hospital for a couple of days, was discharged. She had been there for a respiratory issue, but she was discharged yesterday. And I said to her, Daddy... See, that's our baby. That ain't just their baby. That's our baby. That's your baby. That's a generation of sound. The enemy's coming against the generation of sound that will bruise his, he his head. I told her daddy, I said, now you take your wife and your little girl and go on to the house with your little boy and lock the door and pull the shades and just habitate in the glory. Yeah, that was part of my good day. Another part of my good day was Tatum Snow. I don't know your last name. <laughs> so you, from this moment forward, you are Tatum Brad. So it's going to be a lot easier for me, and that's what's necessary. I know I married you both on March 30th. So it don't matter if I don't know your last name now. <laughs> you are Tatum Brad. Her family gave her a baby shower yesterday for a little boy whose name is going to be Trip. Because like my name is Paul Francis Lanier III, he's going to be named Brad something, Brad Tatum III. <laughs> Myers. 
There you go. Well, it'll come to me sooner or later, usually later, but it'll come to me. And there was a beautiful baby shower for her yesterday. She would have danced up here. That's her song forever, her song, Break Every Chain. But we was afraid something else might break in if she... <laughs> didn't want to have to bring no buckets out in here. Because <laughs> she's good and pregnant. Then as soon as that shower was over, Pastor Debbie and I met in the parking lot somewhere. I have no idea where we were, but she did, so that's all that matters. And she drove us to Baptist Hospital where we went up on the 10th floor, walked in on Ryan and Tasha and their our newborn little girl, Talia Hope. <laughs> Talia Hope. Talia Hope. Talia Hope. Talia. It's Hebrew for dew from heaven. And I said, she's so beautiful. I kept saying she looked like a movie star. She just looks like a I held her for the longest time. Pastor Debbie wanted to hold her. She, she held her some too, and the baby cried a little bit. So <laughs> I took Talia back to myself and just talked to her. And the last name, we got a lot of babies being born right here named Hope. And, and and my name is B.B., if you don't know. Said so that there was a bed. Brian and Heather had have their little boy, and they were trying to teach him how to say Papa Bishop. And that was a long thing when he was just like two weeks old. <laughs> so it became B.B. So for all y'all grandparents, I don't care what they call y'all, my name is B.B. <laughs> so I walked in there, and I said, B.B. is here to see my new little girl. And I'm telling you, she is so beautiful. She is just, so, it was a good day. It was a good day. Three of our babies being blessed. And we got other bla babies and, and Tatum Brad's going to have hers. I think about April the 9th. Who? 31. I know you count, baby. <laughs> She's going to be being wheeled in singing, break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. And I bet there will be an army rising up. I thought about it a couple of days ago. I was sitting on the end of the bed, and I was thinking about these 30 years. We are in our 30th year of hope. I do that a lot these days. And faces crossed my mind that we've walked together 20 years, 25, 30, 15 years together. You don't share my last name, but you couldn't be closer to me. You're so family to me, you ought to just go on and pay my bills. <laughs> just, I said, all right. You step out in faith and go ahead and do what a family does for somebody. Love will pay them bills. And I was thinking about those wonderful days. You see, 30 years ago, I had just turned 30. My wife was 25. A few months into it, our first child, a little girl, was born. A couple of years later, our son was born. And that was pretty much the makeup of this house. It was young couples and small children. And I got to tell you, those were some of the most, I look back now, sometimes it didn't feel like it then, but those were some of the most glorious days, sweet days. We would gather over in the little warehouse in the place I'm telling you, you couldn't fit. We're probably about the size of this choir right here was the whole sanctuary. But we would get in there and we would celebrate the goodness of God. And for an entire year, I preached on nothing but worship. And we found a new vocabulary whereby we could enter his presence and celebrate him so completely and wholly according to the revelation we had then. And he kept stretching that revelation and letting us know more about who he is and how we could approach him and how we could explore. Oh, those were such glad. And you know, but I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. Seemed like it, but I know I'm wrong. It's, it seemed like those days were simpler. I know I'm wrong because there was the Persian Gulf War. There was the impeachment of another president. There was 9-11. There was Iraq. There was Afghanistan. 
But when we came together in those times, okay, it was a sweetness. Seemed like it was. And I got, I loved getting in the pulpit then because even though there were stressors and challenges purely then, it, it felt to me like when I could stand behind the sacred desk, I, 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 I moved from a lightheartedness. Maybe I didn't, but it felt like I did. And the joy of the Lord propelled me. And his sweet love assured me. And we, it was just, I don't know. But when I look at the times in which we are now living, there's not a time that I don't step behind this sacred desk or look into the faces of our people that I don't feel the heaviness of the loads that you are carrying, that I'm not keenly aware of the trauma and the drama that many of you are enduring, challenges, perplexities that you're wondering and complexities that are coming against your mind and your family and your situations and I, I feel it. And then when I dwell in the presence of the Lord and I remain on my face to receive the breathing word of God and I step into this place, I do have the joy of the Lord. It's the only thing keeping me up because I am, I am aware that the enemy is coming to steal, kill, and destroy, that he's attacking our people on global scale. He's coming against families and cities and nations and the world itself. And sometime I say to myself, to the Lord, I say, Lord, why won't you let me just go back to the days where I got to enjoy and, and, and to just feel the light heartedness. I don't mean this in an ugly way. Please forgive me if it sounds this way, but it just ain't fun no more. Maybe it's my age. Maybe it's the age of this ministry, but what I do, it ain't fun no more. But War ain't fun. And we are in a battle for your mind, a battle for your health, a battle for your families, a battle for this nation, for this house, for righteousness. And darkness has come against this nation in the past several days, even at a depth I have never seen. And I say, Lord, why must I stand here and speak about these dark things and these heavy things? It wasn't, we, we didn't ask and the Lord chided me and corrected me. And the Lord reminded me that it was indeed us, we, that we are the ones who fasted our way into intimacy with God, that we are the ones who pressed with the divine dissatisfaction for the superficial, that we were the ones that said we would become whatever he calls us to become and to say whatever prophetic word he put in our mouth. The reason we feel a heaviness is not hell, it's the anointing. I need to say that again because maybe you've become unsure. The heaviness, do you know the Hebrew word for glory means heavy? And so I can tell you on Saturday afternoons, I never need to take a nap like I do on Saturday afternoons about 5, 30, 6 o'clock. And it ain't because I'm sleepy. But it's because the glory for Sunday morning starts resting on me on Saturday afternoon. And I'm delving into the heart of God to retrieve that revelation. He's called me to speak to this house and the heaviness of his person and the heaviness of the cloud of anointing says to my flesh, you need to lay down. You don't have to go through this, but I know if I will yet persevere, if I will say I'll rest later, but right now I'm conversing with the sovereign God of heaven who's sitting upon the throne. If I'll persevere, God will give me a word that I can speak into this house that might be heavy when you're walking, but he'll give you the strength to bear it and anything hell brings against you. So I'm not intimidated by whatever it is God tells me to say. As I tell you, I'm not called to make you happy. I'm called to get you ready. Ready? 
And you can go somewhere else, and they can tell you six months from now what they're going to preach. It don't mean nothing today, and it won't mean nothing six months from now. A sermon is what you preach when you ain't yet got a word. But I got a word for this house and beyond this house. And God has called me to come here and flat-footedly stand before you and to breathe it. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 24, Jesus took his disciples to the Mount of Olives that looks over the holy city of Jerusalem, which is the eternal capital. By God, the eternal capital, 3,000 years. By God, the eternal capital of the city of Israel. He began to speak to them. They wondered, what shall the end be like and when shall it come? You could dissect Matthew chapter 24. The first half of it, he's speaking to their Jewishness because of a calamity, a disaster that will come in a matter of years. It happened in 70 A.D. when Rome came and obliterated the city of Jerusalem, tore down the walls and caused the people to be scattered, those who, who survived. A million people in that season, a million Jews lost their lives. And so Jesus begins to try to prepare them for some of the natural and, and supernatural calamities that are coming to them in a matter of decades. In the first half of Matthew chapter 24. In the second half of Matthew chapter 4, he starts speaking not just to the Jews, but to the Messianic Jews, those who would believe that he is Messiah, and to those of us who are Gentiles, yet we believe in the Jewish Jesus. And he starts talking about those disasters and calamities, of those things that will hit the earth. Some of them we have seen just this week. In a 24-hour period, this week, seven earthquakes hit the state of Oklahoma. Seven earthquakes in the state of Oklahoma. A 5.5, I'm not talking about internationally now, a 5.5 earthquake hit San Diego, California this week. A 3.5 earthquake hit Utah this week. We were talking you know, we were talking over a month ago about the plague of locusts that's decimating East Africa. I spoke with a precious man yesterday from Kenya. And these massive waves, some of the locusts as big as your hand, coming into a field, going into a city, stealing and devouring every bit of resource that would sustain a populace, and then yet moving on. Those locusts are now approaching Iran, Jordan, not just Sudan, Ethiopia, Kenya. All it's going to take is for a few of them to hitch a ride on an airplane to a city near you. Jesus said such would be the times. And you know that we're living in those times now. But, of course, all of us now are obsessed with news about the coronavirus. In 1918, for two years, 1918 through 1920, there was a horrible flu that ravaged the entire world. A hundred million people died, including my great-grandmother and her little boy, who was my mother's uncle just a little fella. And so my grandmother Boyd, my mama's mama, was raised by another family. Changed the trajectory of her life, all of our lives. Airports are being shut down. Airlines are forbidding travelers to go into certain places. Or if you do, you must be in quarantine. Let me speak to you for a second about some of this that has to do with Israel. When my parents were children and they attended Sunday school, there was no such thing as Israel. It was known as Palestine. Where did that name come from? Why wasn't it called Israel? In the Bible, God promised a portion of territory from the Nile to the Euphrates. 
territory. God promised it to Abraham and to Abraham's seed. And they dwelt in that land. Not all of it. They never did occupy, but they will. And from war after war, disobedience and rebellion after disobedience and rebellion, calamity and warfare and occupation and exile has ravaged the land until in 70 A.D. And then years after that, when the, when the Jewish people even rebelled yet again against Rome, a million Jews were killed. Hadrian, who was the Roman emperor, in a final spit against the Jewish people and the land of Israel, changed the name of Jerusalem to Palestine to reflect the name of the, Phil the Philistines, the arch enemies of the Jewish people. Why does the world despise this little, little, you can barely find it on a globe? It is because it is the primary portal place through which heaven has spoken and continues to speak to earth. Hell is trying to stop, to bind, to prohibit the voice of God from being released, the power of God from being demonstrated, and yet God still has taken this group of people, there were 19 million of them, before World War II, after World War II, six million had died. And the number of them has never reached back to 19 million. There were approximately 14 million in the world. And time after again, enemies have come with their might and their military machinery, their sophistication, and being overwhelmingly strong in their numbers, and yet miraculously, a little group of people who were not prepared, had no sense of real identity other than a history and a promise from God, were able to rise up in biblical proportion and confront and overwhelm the enemies that came against them. Tomorrow is Purim. It's a biblical observance when the anti-Semite Haman of Persia or Iran wanted to kill all the Jews. You find it in the Old Testament, your Old Covenant, the Hebrew Scriptures. And Queen Esther, who was Jewish, but who had been exiled to Persia or to Iran, who had become the queen miraculously, when she learned that the anti-Semite, the anti-Jewish, the despiser of God's people intended to kill every living Jew in the region. She learned of it and she called for a three-day absolute fast. There are different kinds of fasts and we talk about that. But a three-day fast, you can live without water for three days. Food you can live without for a long time. But she called for an absolute no water, no food for three days to call upon the name of the Lord. And at the end of those three days, the angel armies of heaven came in, sabotaged the conspiracy of hell through Haman, and rather than destroying and killing the Jewish people, it was Haman himself that the stake was plunged in two, and he lost his life. Unfortunately, tragically, while the nations of the world are focused Upon the state of Israel, many in the body of Christ, many in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ have never put two and two together. We can have Sunday school lessons that talk about Jacob and the heavens open and he saw the angels ascending and descending and he said, I was at the portal place. I was at the gate of heaven and I did not know it. And I say to you, there are precious people gathered in churches today that are oblivious to the plan of God that he's using through the nation of Israel. I decree that as you bless Israel, God blesses you. As you acknowledge the portal place over that place, this becomes a portal place where the revelation of God is dispensed, where the power of God is released, and the people of God can wage war against any enemy that hell wants to bring against your door. This we know. The Word tells us what's coming. There will be cataclysmic events against the state of Israel, probably nuclear, in a coming season. 
A world leader will rise and rally the nations into darkness as never before. There will be an escalation of earthquakes and natural calamities such as the world has never known. There will be a new temple built in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount. I've been beneath in the mosque there, the gold dome, Dome of the Rock. I've been beneath it and seen the stone where it is believed Abraham sacrificed Isaac. Islam has a different narrative, a different story there. They say something else happened there, and they've built a mosque there and a dome there. It would start World War III to try to remove it. I'm not interested in the politics or the military implications. But I tell you by God that whether heaven has to open up and swallow it or one of Hamas rockets that they have absolutely no control over because there is no navigation system on their rockets that they send. There are in Hezbollah up north but not in Hamas's rockets. They may blow it up themselves accidentally. But the third temple will be built there. And the Antichrist will sit in that temple and will betray the people of God, the nation of Israel. And I tell you that the Mount of Olives overlooking the holy city is even now preparing itself for the footprint of our coming Messiah. Your Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 38 that Russia will be coming down to join itself with Persia, which is Iran. I said Russia is coming down in Syria with Iran for the sake of taking Israel. There's already, and Turkey has moved in there. The next big conflict you're going to see is going to be a, a war of sorts between Russia and Turkey. Because that psychopath who rules in Turkey wants to return to the Ottoman Empire, wants Turkey to own all the territory it once did centuries ago. Russia is a little more prudent, if you will. The reason Russia is in there right now has nothing to do with what you might, what, all it's about is profits. Israel is in the process of building the largest underwater pipeline to Italy for the sake of pumping natural gas that Israel has discovered of its own. It will make it incredibly wealthy, pumping natural gas throughout the European Union. President Putin, Prime Minister Putin, whatever the title is he's given to himself lately, he has no intentions of letting that little gnat of a nation steal such profits from him. Ezekiel chapter 38 tells us that war is exceedingly present in its future. I say this to you because you have a right to know. I do believe you because of who you are, because of who we, we are that I should tell you this. This house, this Hope Community Church on Brownsboro Road in Winston-Salem sits at the table of the largest philanthropic organization in all of Israel. Sits at the table of the largest philanthropic organization, Jewish organization in all the world. The International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is the largest Jewish philanthropic organization in all the world, brings in about $130 million a year, has brought in $1.6 billion that's come from Christians for the sole purpose of saving Jewish lives. That was my phrase. I coined that phrase, and now it's on stuff that we're using. The goal is not all these other things. Narrow it down, saving Jewish lives, providing for Holocaust survivors, children, people who are coming in and acclimating from around the world, because the three priorities of the fellowship are poverty, security, and aliyah, helping people who are poor, security, providing for IDF, though not officially, but providing for IDF, the, the, internet, the uh, Israeli Defense Forces, and aliyah, helping people around the world. And you're going to see even more mass exodus taking place from France and other nations who are being slaughtered literally by jihad and lone wolf assassins going in. And eventually you're going to see another Great exodus take place of more Jews going home. The priorities are poverty, security. Even now what we're doing is providing security at synagogues all over the world because of the threats even in this country 
we pay for security at those synagogues because at any given moment, some nutcase will go in there trying to do something. And it's the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews. We've just built five new, six new bomb shelters. We have 5,500 bomb shelters. I wrote to Yael Eckstein. I was asked to be on the board by her father who preached here, spoke here many, many months ago, Rabbi Akhil Eckstein. He passed away last February. Last summer, she asked if I would become chairman of the board of directors. At, the, at that time, you cannot imagine how absurd it seemed. But it's evolving into something totally different that makes sense. I said, surround me with geniuses and I'll do it. And they did. I'm supposed to be in Chicago Tuesday evening, Wednesday morning. I will be there by God. And when I, I wrote to Yael and I said, have we ever had a fast? I mean a big biblical proportion fast. And I talked about what fasting has done in this house. I talked to her about a three-day fast, a seven-day fast, or fasting one meal, or, or a 40-day, whatever it is, finding some way to, to step back from the altar for the sake of the table. And, and not only our staff and administration, but all of those who give so faithfully to the fellowship. The next morning, when, once she had received it because of the time difference, seven-hour difference, she called, and we talked for quite a long time. She said, I need three things from you. I need you to do an infomercial for the fellowship. I need you to write monthly in a column, a fellowship column, and I need you to, to be at the event. We have, we're having an event this week. It's a global summit where our offices from Israel, our offices from Canada, will be meeting with our U.S. offices outside of Chicago for several days where we're implementing the strategies and the systems from a recent uh, a firm. That where we, I'm telling you all of this because you have a right to know it's happening in this house. This is a part of what God is doing. I was speaking to Israel this morning at 4 a.m. Because of the virus, Yael said, I cannot come. Voices from the highest level in Israel have said you don't need to go, and the Israeli delegation will not be coming because of the airline situation, not just the coronavirus, but the airline situation, so that if she does come, and we also have board of directors meetings in, in March, in uh, the latter part of March uh, in Florida, so we were going to do that. She said, when I return, I would have to be in quarantine for two weeks. Why is that such a situation? Because don't be surprised when the enemy weaponizes the virus to where people who were willing to blow themselves up anyway will go and get the virus and walk on a train, walk through the subway, get on a bus, walk in the school, go through the most vulnerable places of a rest home or a daycare, and you don't even know what's happened. You don't even realize that in a matter of days, people could be dying, and you have no idea that a terrorist brought that germ. And, and so I said to her, we cannot afford So I'm going Tuesday night. I'll be there in Wednesday morning speaking because this is what I said to her. The fellowship is uniquely qualified to do what we're called to do now, but we're not remotely ready for what's coming. And war, which is coming, whether it be from Hamas over in Gaza or Hezbollah up in Lebanon or whatever's coming out of Syria, that war will expose the holes in our system. It always does. And I said, so what we had better understand is it's not by might. And it's not by power. But it's by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And so I'm calling upon every person in the fellowship, the Israeli offices. I'm speaking by Skype, so Wednesday morning, to the Israeli offices and talking to them about fasting. I've been told this whole idea is unprecedented, that a Pentecostal <laughs> pastor is going to be speaking to Orthodox Jews about the need for fasting, that the angel armies of heaven, and I've said I'm praying that like God did through Elisha, God is going to open the eyes of every one of us, and we will see the armies of God, the angelic hosts of heaven surrounding us. So you don't have to spend your time counting the number of enemies. Instead, look into the stars that are innumerable and know that your God is the one who placed him there. Yeah. 
On, November, on, on May the 7th, I'm supposed to be in Washington for the National Day of Prayer, doing an, a, a live there so that everybody connected with fellowship and beyond around the world to where we're going to be praying because I was asked, and Yael said, I want you to be known not simply as the CEO of the fellowship, the board of directors, but I want you to be known as the spiritual leader of the fellowship. Do we understand? Maybe that don't mean nothing. I'm not talking about being ego-driven. I'm talking about being in awe of what God is doing, that through five loaves and fishes. Forgive me, I just received a message. Saturday is Shabbat in Israel, so Sunday morning is their Monday morning. So most of the mail I get from Israel comes early Sunday morning because they're like, we're starting to work now. I'm going to church. We're still starting to work. And this is about counseling meetings. I'm having a meeting tonight here in Winston-Salem where one of the reps will be here to talk. For several weeks, we've been talking about 1 Kings chapter 17. Ten minutes, I'll be through. We talked about how the prophet Elijah stepped into the presidential throne room, the king, the royal throne room, where King Ahab and Queen Jezebel sat in court in Samaria and ruled and reigned there. That it was filled with debauchery and idolatry, despising the holiness of of the people of God, determined to kill the prophets of God. But Elijah went and did not simply provide a prophetic word to a man and a woman, but gave a territorial word that said, you follow a God, little g, named Baal, and you believe that Baal causes the rains to come, and from the rains to come, the plants grow, and from the plants that grow, the animals eat, and from the animals that eat, the people are sustained. But I have come in the name of the Lord to tell you that I've come to shut down your God. And it shall not rain for three years. In fact, later on, we're going to see, and we won't do it today, but later on at Mount Carmel. Later on at Mount Carmel, Elijah stands there. And he says to them, you have sacrifices here that your God, you believe Baal is going to respond to. You're, you've got sacrifices on your altar. Go ahead and take water on my altar. Pour water on my altar. Your God didn't do nothing. But not only is my fire coming, but go ahead and pour water, the name of your God. And we're pouring buckets of idolatry on my sacrifice. And when my God shows with fire, not only is he going to consume my sacrifice, but lick up every idolatrous drop of water so you will know that the God of Israel rules and reigns. I speak to you, beloved Hope Community Church, in an idolatrous age. Don't be intimidated by the lies and the schemes and the conspiracies that might come from idolatrous temples. But be well assured that the presence of God will come and receive your covenant gift. God will receive your, and as you lay it on the altar, the fire of God will receive it and fight back every lying, idolatrous spirit that hell spews in your direction. The Bible said that God said to him, now I want you to leave. Why? Because you got to know that there are waiting moments and walking moments of faith. God said, I have prepared a place for you. Leave here. Go to a place called Cherith. It's going to be a place of miracle provision. I've already had a conversation with a bird. Ah. God knows how to talk to a bird. God knows how to talk to a donkey that can prophesy. He knows how to talk to another donkey and say, one day you're going to carry 
Messiah, even into the Holy City. He even knows how to talk to a dog and say, go on and lick your lips. There's coming a moment when Jezebel's going to die and you're going to drink up her blood. God said to the prophet, you have spoken rightly the territorial word. Now leave that place. Come over to a place of obscurity. Nobody going to know who you are, where you are, but the bird. And the bird is going to bring you the king's food in the morning, going to bring you the king's food in the nighttime. And you're going to watch the water and it's going to begin to deteriorate and shrink. But don't be intimidated because none of that is keeping you alive. It is the same word of God that you spoke. The word that you spoke to Ahab, I'm speaking to you. I have commanded that that water shall keep you and that the raven shall bring you food. I shared with you that I am convinced. Last year, last January, we spoke a territorial word that Pentecost is territorial. We could never have imagined even then all that God is doing through this house now that we get beyond our selfiness to the sentness of his calling upon our lives. And as we speak such a word, he then positions us. And there's sometimes in that obscurity and that isolation, you feel alone. You feel as if nobody knows where you are and nobody cares what's happening in your life. And all you've got to do is watch the pool of provision begin to shrink and you see famine and plagues around you. You hear the, choir, the, the, the cries of people. You look around and you see animals that are dropping dead and no vegetation that is rising. You hear people saying, what are we going to do? But you are being sustained and kept by the promises of God. And then there came the moment after a year, God says, now, I want you to walk 85 to 90 miles to a place called Zarephath. I've also had a conversation with a widow who in her mind, in her thinking, speaking, and living, she's dying. In her thinking, speaking, and living, her son is dying. But I want you to trek. Don't worry about the animals that you might hear in the nighttime. Don't wonder if there are thieves. They ain't going to touch you. My angels go before you. Yeah and have prepared an exit for every lying thing that tries to step and interrupt what I've called you to do. Yes. Don't worry about being by yourself. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. But I need to give you a heads up that when I take you there, it shall not be an explosion of euphoria. It will not be the place of gladness. It is a place of darkness and devils and demons and discouragement. Because when you get to the gate, there's a woman there who's going to die if you don't show up. Elijah showed up. He looked around and he realized, this ain't no friendly place. This is Jezebel's backyard and a daddy who's the high priest of idolatry and the king of Phoenicia dwells, rules. I'm in range of an arrow right now, but ain't nothing going to get me unless it comes through the word of God that has cocooned me. I didn't come here because I want to. I came here because I was brought here. And so he gets to the gate. When you get to the gate of the worst moment of your life, what are you going to say? Because the giants are waiting to hear. And he goes to the woman and he says, like Jesus did, give me to drink. Like Eliezer did, give me to drink. He says, give me to drink. And as she's moving, I say it and I'm going to say it again. There's nothing more important than what you think, speak, and do between your first doctor's appointment and your second. When they say, well, this is what the tests show. This is what the blood work indicates. And you hear them and you let them speak from their expertise and you thank them and you appreciate them because they have schooled themselves in the best that they could learn. But when they say that to you, don't be angry at them. They're telling you how far it is they can go and where God must pick up. I ain't mad at you when you tell me you can't do no more. I ain't mad at you when you say we have no more medicine. All you have did is show me the baseline of your potential. But I live, I breathe, I have my being in the yes and amen of God. I am cocooned in covenant. I am 
kept in the hand of Almighty God. I am sustained by the breathing word of the Lord that says, I ain't never going to leave you. I ain't never going to forsake you. I'm not going to go any further right there, but I'm going to tell you this. That'll be for next week. Some people don't want to step into the throne room and speak the prophetic word that shuts down the reins of heaven. You need to know something. We look at the crises and the dilemmas. We are not called to stick our head in the sand. We're called to keep our head in the cloud. So I don't even hear what you're saying because I'm hidden by his hand. Others don't want to live, leave, live alone at the pool of water. Elijah was by himself. Who's going to agree with the word of the Lord? He didn't have nobody. Others don't want to live alone at the pool of water. The shrinking day by day, enduring the stripping, because the word cherith means stripping. You've done everything you know to do. You've been obedient. You're walking in, can I say this? You're walking in faith. You're living obedient. God said, speak a word, and you spoke a word, but there's still something got to come off of you before you get to Zarephath. Ain't because you've done wrong. It's because you're going to do better. It's because I was prepared for then, but I ain't prepared for yonder. And so the Lord going to say, you remember that relationship? I got to take that off of you right now. Not because it was bad then, but it can't go from where I'm taking you. You know that idea and that philosophy that you had? Hey, it was fine back yonder at Cherith, but it won't work in Zarephath. Hey, 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 you know the way you did that, that, that worked back there in that brook, but it won't work over here. So I'm telling some folk, if it feels like you're losing some stuff, don't chase it. Never chase anything or anybody that leaves you in a fast. You tell me that you left the job or they fired you. Don't go looking for the same job. You're a sheriff. God is stripping off of you. God's taking off something that might have blessed you yesterday, but it'll bind you tomorrow. And if you try to stay a sheriff longer than the word of God has assigned you, that's going to be your drought. That's going to be your famine. But as long as I move when God says move, Others don't want to abandon it because they don't know what lies ahead and they're afraid. Others dread the treacherous journey and the prophetic process of moving from glory to glory. Others want to avoid the gate of Jezebel's backyard in range of her father's arrows. So I'm going to put three scriptures in your belly today. Proverbs 21. The king's heart is like a stream of water directed by the Lord. Your God guides it wherever he pleases. I said, I know Mr. Putin over here. I know the president of Turkey. I understand Assad in Syria. I know what the Ayatollah in Iran. I hear what you're saying, but God holds their hearts in the palm of his hand and they ain't going to live one moment longer than the moment he squeezes and says enough. Your day is not established. Your life is not predicated upon the edicts of dying devils. But I live, breathe, have my being. My steps are ordered and I ain't in a hurry walking through them because he holds the hearts of every lying king in his hand. But what about the plagues? Psalm 91. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling, my refuge and most high, no evil will befall you. No plague will approach your tent for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all. I'm going to read it again and I'm on it. 
because I have made the Lord my dwelling, my refuge, the most high. No evil will befall me. No plague will approach my tent for he will command his angels concerning me to guard me in all my ways. Finally, Jesus says in Matthew 18, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. This is a restraining order from the courtrooms of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I need somebody who knows your authority through the blood of Jesus, who's filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, who knows how to prophesy and speak the breathing word and to write in the blood stained red of Jesus. This is a restraining order against every lying spirit, every diagnosis, every prediction, every conspiracy, every... And when you come knocking on my door, I'm gonna say, tell it to the blood. Tell it to the blood. I say, look, I came here for church. I don't know why you're here, but I'm here for church. I said, oh, you wanna bring that disease in my, tell it to the blood. Well, I came to break up your family, tell it to the blood. I came to steal your job and make you wonder where your next meal's got. Tell it to the name. Tell it to the blood. I'm going to tell you the times I wish the love of Jesus would fill us so much that we'd race up to the upper room and learn how to speak in tongues through the power. But if for no other reason, I believe the crises of our time are going to make a lot of Pentecostals out of folk who deny it today. You might turn your back on it tomorrow, but what you going to do when you got to lay your hands on your baby and pray healing or they going to die? I got a restraining order. Now, if your brother-in-law signs it, it don't mean nothing. But your Savior and your Redeemer and the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords done took a pen and dipped it in the blood and said, keep your hands off God's property. And then he put a little exclamation point right now. I came to preach to somebody. I came to prophesy to the house. Ain't no Lord but Jesus. I decree our babies are well. I decree that we got so many old folk in here because they can't die. They'd love to see his face. They'd love to walk streets of gold, but they're a sign. Lord Moses didn't even know who he was till he was 80 years old. Abraham didn't become the daddy God called till he was 100. So you might need to call the home and say, put that off a decade. I'm determined you're going to be blessed. You ain't got to be. There's plenty of churches that'll take you if you don't want to be blessed. Till he said, you can bind on earth, it'll be bound, take a restraining order. You can loose. What does that mean? I loose the greatest blessing. I loose wisdom all over you that you know the ways of God. I loose his power that you know you're able to do anything God calls you to do. I loose every provision that you need to be obedient. I loose a spirit of sanity in your crazy house. I loose the glory of the Lord that the devil comes out your witchy wife. 
I pray that the glory of the Lord will touch your demonic husband, that that devil will be chased back to hell and some semblance of sanity will return and unity will rise and agreement will prevail and the glory of the Lord shall hover your house. I'm just trying to read the Bible. Again, truly I say to you that if two or three on earth will, on earth will agree, can anybody agree in here? About anything that they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven, for where two or three gather in my name there. Where? There. Where? There. In agreement, in agreement, in agreement. He said, I need to agree. Is there anybody here that agree today? I know you don't get along with a lot of people, but would you agree with the word of the Lord? I'm going to say some stuff, and when I point to you, I want you to say, and I agree in the name of Jesus. I decree you are the redeemed of the Lord. And I agree in the name of Jesus. You are created by the brilliant God of heaven. And I agree in the name of Jesus. I am saved by the blood of the crucified one. I am filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. I agree the name of Jesus. His word is in my mouth. I agree the name of Jesus. His angels are by my side. I agree the name of Jesus. My steps are ordered. I agree the name of Jesus. And I won't be put in a hurry by fear. I agree the name of Jesus. But I walk by faith. I agree the name of Jesus. Not by sight. I agree the name of Jesus. I'm made whole. And blessed. I agree the name I'm prospered. I agree the name My household I agree is an extension I agree the name of, of the throne room of God. I agree the name of and if you can't find it in heaven, I agree the name of it won't dwell in my house. I agree the name of I'm saved. I agree I'm the name healed. I agree the name I'm whole. I'm prosperous. I agree the name of Jesus. I'm wealthy. I agree the name of Jesus. I'm kept. I agree the name of Jesus. I'm secure. I agree the name of Jesus. And as for me and my house, I agree the name of Jesus. every one of us I agree the name will serve the Lord. I agree the name of Jesus. Upon this, I make my declaration. The word of the Lord. The Lord put it in my heart this week that we should take the body and blood of Jesus every Sunday. It's amazing how many people will be taking it all of a sudden. It's like all these folk going to wash by soap now. What was you washing your hands with? <laughs> we ain't got no more soap. Call them people was dirty. Let me just go and put a, just a little bit of kingdom etiquette here. When you go, see, living kosher ain't about imposing laws. It's about rules for living. In the, New, in the Old Testament, the Lord even told them when you're taking two and a half million people traveling and you need to have a bowel movement, don't go to the river. Your Bible say this, in the same place and you shall receive power. It said, go outside the camp, dig a hole, do your business, and cover it up so there ain't no plague there. There won't no bubonic. <laughs> and folk all over the world eating these crazy things thinking they're exotic. It's demonic. Not exotic. It's demonic. You eat the devil, the devil's going to be in you. So when you go to somewhere, anywhere, and you go to the bathroom, wash your hands. I watch folk don't wash their hands. You are nasty. <laughs> nasty people. When you wash your hands real good with warm water and soap, 
and you rinse them off real good, get you that paper towel and dry them off and hold on to your paper towel to open the door lest you catch what the person who didn't wash their hand. That's in your Bible. It's in the book of I Say So. I said, take your paper towel. Would it be better if I shout it? I said, take your paper towel, wash your hands with the soap, dry them off with the paper towel, and touch the door, nasty door handle that the fool didn't wash his hands. But you can carry your disease with you, but it shall not come nigh my tent. Y'all right? Y'all right? I say, you are blessed, and you're wise, and you're smart, and you're prudent. We ain't foolish, but we ain't fearful. We're aware, but not afraid. We are the redeemed of the law, and his blood still works. Stain of sin. 